Happy to be here today and uh, excited to talk to you about something other than uh, brown goby for a change. Uh, I've got the results from a couple of years of a, uh, I guess, a, a fairly large uh, collaborative uh, study trying to learn more about what's going on with American eel in the Mohawk River watershed. Um, so quick background on what I'm going to cover here today. Um, start just with a tiny bit of information about what we know or what we think we know about eels um, in the Mohawk River watershed historically. Uh, and then I'm going to take you through a two-phase study. So phase one, essentially we tried to build a relationship between the quantity of environmental DNA in the water, American eel DNA in the water, and the actual density of eels in the water per unit area, so eels per you know, hectare or whatever unit you want to use. And then with that model in hand, we went to the Mohawk watershed and tried to actually make inferences not only about where um, American eels are located, but potentially at what abundances. Um, so quickly here, um, there's folks in the room here who probably know this story better than I do, but um, historical evidence suggests that eels were widespread in the Mohawk River watershed and potentially abundant. Um, this information comes from a few different sources, um, historical accounts um, in the primary literature, uh, presence of old eel weirs um, and some tributaries, and the fact that most folks like to point to uh, one of the major tributaries, the Alplaz Kill, uh, in is Dutch and translates to either place of the eel or home, home of eels. Um, more recently, uh, eels are nearly absent um, from the watershed. Um, if you know the Mohawk watershed, there's a series of barriers around the mouth, uh, one natural barrier, Coos Falls, and a number of man-made barriers. Um, upstream of that series of barriers, that's upstream of Crescent Dam and the Waterford Flight of Locks, once you get upstream of that, there have been, to our knowledge, looking through every information source we could get our hands on, about 16 observations of American eel um, actually in the greater watershed once you're above that series of barriers by the mouth. Um, I had to, uh, actually Josh, if you can give me a click here perhaps. Um, this is just to get everyone in an eely mood. This is, uh, whoop, no. sorry, um, yeah, click anywhere in the, in the video there. Um, this is just a release video from the phase one study I'm about to show you, but this is just to, to get everyone excited and uh, ready, ready for eels the rest of the 15 minutes here. So phase one, um, the purpose here was to try to figure out is there a relationship between the quantity of eel, eDNA, and the actual abundance of eels. We knew we couldn't do this in the Mohawk watershed because we can't catch enough eels in the Mohawk watershed to do this. So the practical location to attempt this was on tributaries to the Hudson River. Um, we got input from a handful of local experts and we tried to select sites that were gonna span a range of eel abundance and really with an emphasis on the low end of the spectrum because we knew the Mohawk watershed was gonna have low densities. So we wanted to capture that here um, in that relationship. And these were done with paired eDNA and electrofishing, separated by usually about an hour. So we did our absolute best to tighten this up. Um, we tried to be really rigorous with this because we knew if the relationship we built here was not built on solid ground, then all um, inferences made with it in phase two were gonna be worthless. So we used two different molecular marker, markers. Um, this is done in, um, in collaboration with the Lamar uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Wildlife Service Lab that you just heard about, Chris Reese and Meredith Bartron. Uh, two different qPCR markers, uh, two field replicates taken in rapid succession at each site, um, and a field blank taken before every single site, which is far more rigorous than you'd normally have in a typical protocol, but we really wanted to get this right or phase two would have no value. Um, and electrofishing three-pass depletion surveys, so we're actually getting quantitative estimates of eels per unit area, um, 100 meter reaches. So, Here's a quick snapshot of the 15 Hudson River tribs that we looked at. I'm not going to dwell on them because phase two is really what we want to talk about. But um, on this figure here, you'll see this again. The red sites are the Hudson River tributary sites. So these are two sites on the, uh, the Sauk Hill, which is as far south as we went. Um, and all the yellow sites are phase two, which we're going to get into momentarily here. So. Um, was there a relationship between eDNA concentration and number of eels? You would assume yes, but never want to take anything for granted. This is arranged based on estimated eel density as number per thousand square meters. And we go from highest concentration on the Sauk Hill um, to four sites here where we actually failed to capture a single eel, 
but inter interestingly, we still have DNA positives at uh, very weak eDNA positives using both molecular markers. So this essentially tells us that 100 meters was not long enough to truly assess yield presence absence. And at a couple of these trips, we further verified that by cherry picking some good habitat upstream of the reach that we did and qualitatively saying, oh look, there, you know, there's an eel. Uh, so, you know, just looking quickly at the relationship between density and DNA concentrations, you know, he's, well, it looks decent, maybe there's something there. Um, Dan Stitch uh, was kind enough to help us with some of the modeling here. You probably recognize Dan's work. Um, in the interest of time, the winning relationship here, they're all pretty similar, but it was using the AME1 uh, mitochondrial marker, and we used density. So the top two graphs here are the density um, of eel. The bottom two graphs are using the biomass, or grams of eel. So density worked a little bit better, and the AME1 marker um, worked a little bit better. These are probably trivial differences, honestly, but going forward for phase two, this was the relationship that we attempted um, to go forward with. Oh, yeah, and this guy. Um, this is the, the blocky kill um, tributary here, which is quite a thorn in our side. You'll see it had the third greatest eel density, but almost an order of magnitude higher DNA concentration. Um, and this really, I would say, negatively affected the, uh, the regression here, but um, the block eel is very small um, and potentially has a lot of habitat upstream of where we worked without barriers and there's probably a lot of eels above us contributing DNA and that's, that's just, you know, life using these molecular methods. So getting into phase two, we said, all right, we actually have this model in hand. It's, it's not great, but it's good. Um, let's go to 36 sites in the Mohawk watershed and take eDNA samples. Um, the sites spanned a pretty wide range. Um, we hit most of the major tributaries. We hit a number of locations in the main stem of the Mohawk and uh, a number of sites around the confluence of the Mohawk um, and Hudson. And looking at the map here, um, again, you've got tributary and main stem sites here. And if you're not from the capital region, um, the confluence here between the Mohawk and Hudson is really quite a jumble. So if you're an eel trying to move upstream, first barrier you hit is the Federal Lock and Dam, or Troy Lock and Dam. Um, once you get through there, um, you now have a couple options. You can take the Waterford Flight of Locks to get around Cohoes Falls and get into the Lower Mohawk River, or you can go um, through the branches of the Mohawk. Fourth Branch Dam here, we'll call this a partial barrier because you can get around this without actually having to go through it. Um, then you hit the New York State Dam, which is a complete barrier, we'll say. Um, after that, it's Cohoes Falls, uh, I don't know what 100 foot waterfall, give or take. Um, what is it? 75 to 90. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, then you hit Cohoes Falls, which apparently uh, eels were able to ascend historically um, with good success, which is kind of astonishing when you stand next to it and look at it, but this is what eels do. Um, and then we've got two more dams and associated hydroelectric facilities. So a real jumble here. We essentially were able to bracket, I think, every one of these barriers, except maybe we didn't get in here, as I recall. So what did those data show? Um, no, too soon, sorry. Um, we did this twice, um, and honestly, that was still inadequate. I'm very confident, but you know, this is a lot of work and, and lab expense just in the current capacity here. So we had all 36 sites in May of 2021, and again in August of 2021, generally sampling under base flow stable conditions to the extent that we could. We used the same two molecular